Thank you, Bob. Um, just a little bit of context uh, about myself before I kind of dig in here. Uh, I don't consider myself a big data expert. I'm a technologist who kind of loves technology and likes seeing it get applied to solve business problems, but I don't consider myself a guru in either CRM or big data, so just, just a caveat up front. Uh, I am a fan of NPR. Uh, my uh, wife used to work at GBH and uh, was a producer for Latino USA, USA here at KUT, so I've had a long history uh, in being involved in NPR through her and certainly I'm a supporter of the network and at Convio we served a lot of NPR stations so I have a, an affinity and understanding for what you guys do. Um, I'd like to just start by asking a question of you guys. When you hear the term big data, what does it mean to you? And maybe Mike, would you like to take the first cut of that? Um, you can tell I'm not a broadcast guy because I don't know how to use the mic. Um, you know, big data to me is, it sounds more spooky or oogie of a term than it really is. I think it is about collecting information about your audience at the individual level. I think that's, that is the first place you start, is you have data that allows you to establish an individual relationship with people. Great. Any other perspectives in the room? So are there any vignettes you think of? You know, so maybe not just a definition of big data or any stories that you've read when you've heard, heard the term synonymous uh, with big data as well? Anything come to mind? I think of what uh, President Obama's campaign did to get to know people not at the uh, typical campaign level of a neighborhood, but they knew about you and your house and what you did and whether or not to robocall you and all the rest. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bob. Uh, this is conjecture, it could be way off, but that it is, it is individual, but not necessarily uh, personally identifiable. Okay. Mm -hmm. May or may not be. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts when you hear the term big data? Yes, in the middle. I think it's making sure that you understand your audience. I think it's Netflix telling me, hey, you like House of Cards, you might like Breaking okay. Bad. Well, that's a really interesting uh, parlay. Um, so let's talk about some uses of big data out there in the world today, and Netflix is a prime example. They're not just, not just in terms of the filtering that you see to see content that's relevant for you. Though I've got to say, I had my parents stay with me last summer and they watched, watch a lot of Hindi movies, and I can't remove that from the filter now. Uh, all I see is Hindi movie recommendations, so it doesn't work that quite, quite that well. Um, but Netflix and the House of Cards, that's a really, do you guys know the story of how House of Cards was strategized? Um, that's a brilliant, okay, I'll, I'll repeat it for those of you who haven't heard it. So Netflix obviously can crunch an enormous amount of data. They're a global company, you know, office, you know, presence in Europe as well. And they saw that House of Cards in Europe was really doing extremely well, or a British rendition of it. And then they also saw that um, Kevin Spacey and the director behind Facebook, that anything that they produced or were in, did really well. Did really well. And they sort of put these things together, these correlations as it were, and crafted um, a concept for an American House of Cards with Kevin Spacey. And, um, you know, of course it's done uh, incredibly well, but it's an example of kind of crunching data. The other one that's sort of been in the news a lot about uh, big data is the Target story, uh, Target stores. Have you guys all heard that story as well? A little bit eerie, uh, where, you know, they're crunching the data around what consumers are buying and then drawing and inferring correlations. So if you buy scent-free lotions, does that mean that you're expecting, etc. And that's the big brother side of big data that, you know, people are a bit, you know, eerie about. But a lot of things um, occur that are, have been less in the news. Regions bank. So a lot of companies do retargeting when you visit their website and then they retarget to come to come back to you. There's actually a whole industry now of firms who are actually trying to refine that whole side of big of retargeting to say Let's find the attributes in a predictive model that say it's worth spending money on retargeting certain people and not on, on retargeting others. Or let's even sort of go beyond that and say who in the public internet um, fits my sort of um, predictive model in terms of behavior. And let's show targeted ads to them whether or not they've come to my site before. And some of the banks in the financial industry are trying to do that kind of, kind of lead, generation, lead generation effort. 
There's also some very positive things going on in the world of big data. Um, IBM has been working with um, Sloan Kettering Cancer Hospital to find a, a cure for certain strains of cancer by you know, crunching massive amounts of unstructured data as well. So what we really talk about, what we really think about when it comes to, data, uh, to big data is typically enormous sets of data that um, it's hard to process and consume in traditional systems. So if you've got a CRM system or a direct marketing system or a fundraising system like a Razor's Edge or uh, whatever, um, or, a, or a team approach, it just becomes uh, unimaginable to think about processing that kind of data and making intelligence of it in one of those systems. The systems are just simply not powerful enough to consume it. Now, when people typically think of big data, they think of it in terms of petabytes, like massive amounts of data. And I would actually posit that in this sector and in the nonprofit sector that I came out of, we almost need sort of a, you know, a, a commas around big data, that it isn't big data in the commercial sense, but it's still meaningful interpretation of insights that exist and are there for us to derive from our individual interactions with our membership and our audience and our consumers. And there's just enormous value in this. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the commercial world is that some companies are reorienting all of their investment in this area. Procter & Gamble, for example, the CIO there, has decided to outsource anything he considers non-core in the area of IT. So just implementing business systems, et cetera. He said, I'm fine with sending them out to third parties and to contractors to do. I, myself, in-house, need to build a competency around data because I think that's our future. Interpreting, collecting, aggregating, and analyzing data is, is where the needle is going to be moved most, and that's where the strategic investment is being placed. And listening into the conversation here, I'm glad to see that you guys are on this journey, but I see just a large amount of opportunity in really sort of taking that next step and leaping forward. And what we're going to talk about today is, you know, where are the opportunities for NPR to explore big data? Um, where's the low-hanging fruit? And what, what baby steps should we be taking in that direction to actually get some results in this area? Would you like to add anything, Mike, as we... No, I think it's great. So what could it mean for NPR? I think I'm a fundraising guy. Well, at least I was for the last 12, 13 years. So this is my orientation. I know that most of you guys are more on the, on the audience development side of things on digital. Um, but I think about revenue and, um, you know, how can we monetize the audience we have today as well as grow that audience? So, you know, the thing I've heard for over a decade now is that there is this golden rule that 10% of uh, your audience are members. And I know it varies a little bit station to station, but it feels like this magic ceiling that no one is really prepared to say, that's just not right. It should be 25%. It should be 30%. In the world of university fundraising, we see schools like UT that may have about a 15% participation rate, but we see schools like Princeton, you know, with like more like a 45 to 55% participation rate. And it may be because of the school experience or it's private versus public, but there isn't sort of this barrier that men people mentally think about that's insurmountable. And I would say one of the things that we should start to debunk is, you know, can we leveraging insights about our audience break this myth that we have to, that we're kind of capped at 10% as a penetration for membership within our audience. Boosting retention and average gift. Um, when I first started Convio, uh, I remember speaking to the director of marketing at WBUR in Boston, who told me that a 4% lift in retention rate for first year members would drive about 10 to 15% to their bottom line just because of the math of how expensive it is to you know, acquire people and renew them and that retention has a massive impact. Um, what we found in our time is that engaging people through multiple channels uh, boosted retention. One of the questions I'd ask you guys is for the people who use your app, you know, has that boosted retention rates? Do we know that? Is that, is that an inferable insight? Are, who the, are the people who are streaming with you, uh, are they becoming members at a higher rate than the golden 10% rule? Are they renewing at a higher rate than your typical first year retention rate? You know, are there these insights that we can derive in our data? And can we drive average gift up by knowing a little bit more about people as well in terms of targeting them differently? And I'm gonna share an example of that with you later. Sustainers, um, it's, been a f it's been really great to see a lot of NPR 
stations uh, really promote sustainers. I know living here in Austin, KUT has done a great job of pushing their sustainer program and their leadership giving program as well. But how do you know who to target for a sustaining gift? Can the digital data that you guys create help us infer that? If someone is um, you know, reading every email you send them um, and forwarding them to friends or active with you on social, is that predictive? Is that predictive in any way that they're passionate? Click down a level. If they're reading certain content, is that predictive in some way that they're more likely to respond to a certain kind of targeted ask? than a generic ask as well. I mean, what data insights can we mine from there? Sponsorship, as you have your hands around all of this data and you know that your demographic is shifting, you know, again, KUT launching KUTX, the music station here, younger demographic, how can we turn around and harness that data to go after a new set of sponsors to say, not only do we have these audiences, they're wide, they're digital, they're younger, but we can tell you you know, we can tell you valuable insights about just how engaged they are. That's very monetizable uh, kind of data. If we think about commercial sites who uh, are more on a CPM model, like Spiceworks, a big IT community here in, that's based in Austin, they're getting CPM rates of 150 to $180 because it's a very high quality engagement with their audience and a very targeted, um, and a very targeted audience. And I'm not saying we're going to transition to an ad-based model, but the truth is anyone who's sponsoring you you know, thinks about it or will think about it in terms of ROI, you know, and I think, you know, we've got to start acting and behaving like that to kind of have that kind of calculus in our heads. Um, eliminating pledge, controversial. Um, I don't think it's going to happen in the next 24 months, but if we really understood our members and could activate them with the triggers that they cared about, this person, you know, loves car talk or marketplace, etc., or, you know, listens at these times and streams, etc. If we really understood them as individuals, would pledge really be necessary? I mean, it's this sort of interrupting in your face thing just to get people to give it a certain, and it's effective. But, you know, is it, you know, project five or 10 years from now, is it something that should really be part of our framework? Or should we be thinking about, you know, how do we find alternatives that are a lot, a lot more customer centric? you know, a lot more, you know, uh, in line with uh, serving the needs of our membership and our audience that would replace it. So I know these are fairly controversial topics, but anyone want to weigh in? Mike? Um, I will say that for Minnesota Public Radio, perhaps the single greatest um, financial gain for the company has been the growth of sustainers. 60% of our membership, of the 130,000 rough members we have, 60% of them are sustainers. Um, and you cannot do that without knowing who those people are. And so if you're going to make an investment, one of the questions, Vinay, that I was going to, maybe we'll get to later, but I, I would ask you up front, you know, this is a really diverse room of people. How many of you have at least one full-time dedicated digital person in your company. Okay. So there's probably at least 20% of the people in this room who don't have a full-time dedicated digital person. Where do you start? Yeah, we had a conversation about this over dinner because um, I was sitting at a table with Oklahoma and uh, Waco. I hope you don't mind me singling you out. And the truth is, um, this is a model I've seen a lot in other multi-affiliate nonprofits, Red Cross, The Nature Conservancy, etc. Uh, I was privileged to have a chance to serve a lot of these groups. And what I saw them do is drive more to a um, kind of an organizational model that said, here's what can be done and should be done at a local level, and here's what we need to regionalize or take national. So I'm not trying to get into an org design model uh, exercise. I'd be happy to give my two cents if, if asked to do so at some point. But I think we've got to be pragmatic about what happens where. At the Nature Conservancy, they've built a regionalized marketing model where they've said it's unrealistic for our local chapters and offices to do sophisticated marketing, be it digital or direct mail. We're going to regionalize that. We're going to ask our locals to give us content to make the content you know, relevant so that one in three stories is local, the other two can be regional and national. 
Um, but we're not going to expect them to build capacity at that local level because it's very, very hard to build capacity or maybe not economic to build capacity at that local level. Capacity is human capacity or system capacity. So it's an org design model, honestly. Um, uh, but it doesn't preclude the fact that there's value in doing this. Where it gets done is the bigger question. How many of you have a specific goal, a strategic goal for your current year related to one of these items? Increasing sponsorship, increasing sustainers, um, increasing major gifts. Does anybody have an actual number tied to this? Okay, that's interesting. Um, for those of you who do, what information, I mean, what pieces of data are you thinking about or what are you trying to do right now to tackle that, to grow that number? I saw someone's hand up front. Yeah, I, I, I would say uh, sustainers, very definitely, it's, it's the next big thing. Uh, we just had a big meeting with uh, Valerie, among others. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, what convinced me for us to, to commit to it in terms of our messaging on air and so on was a simple idea, which is that the effort that, that we take to get someone to renew on an annual basis is expensive with all the mail you send and all that and there's lag time I mean think think how many of us really know when our renewal is up and and so I figured that if and someone that that pledges annually actually gives every 15 months we've lost three months every time that happens and so just moving that revenue from the future into the now that alone would have an impact on us and then other stuff we're learning about how long you retain them, how if you engage in the right practices, they actually continue to raise their, uh, their annual giving and so on. It, it's all very powerful. And so we're, we're building our next year's strategy around sustainers as one of our key growth areas. Yeah, we did a big sustainer push in our fall drive. And it was, <clears throat> the big number was really nice. But getting that pipeline filled up is going to take a year. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing it's, it's happening. Uh, that's one kind of a word of warning. You know, be, be, be cautious to look at the big number, but make sure it's being fulfilled. Uh, and by doing sustainers, you're taking care of a lot of those things on that list. You know, the retention, what you just talked about. Uh, our average gift went up. Now we're trying to get, uh, get, get to go up again. Instead of $10 a month, try 15 or whatever. Uh, and then it, it kind of trickles down too into more sponsorship too, uh -huh. as, as your user base gets bigger. Yeah, last time I saw the math on sustainers, and this isn't an NPR; it's sort of in you know the animal welfare sector and so forth. The lifetime value of a sustainer is usually eight to ten times as high as um, a, a single gift donor, just because of retention rate differences, um, you know, average annual giving, and frankly, the economics to serve them as well. You know, you're not spending as much on reactivation and so forth. Stuart. So, what is the data we look at to target someone as a potential donor and sustainer? Well, that's, that's the art here. It's uh, building a predictive model and understanding which variables are predictive. And I'll get into some examples of that now. Uh, well, I'll get into some examples of it here generically, but I think part of what the opportunity is is to craft that predictive model for your market and understand is it third party data like psychographics and affluence and so forth? Is it engagement? Is it the fact that someone's digitally engaging with you that becomes predictive in terms of a higher propensity to become a sustainer? Uh, is it their past giving patterns? Is it their RFM, you know, essentially? And what we're finding in the commercial world and in the more advanced nonprofits is that certainly recency, frequency and value of previous gifts are hyper, hyper predictive but those predictive models can be enhanced with digital data and psychographic data and all of these other sources of things to help you build a refined model. And you only need to turn the dial 5% to make a big, big economic difference. I mean, I can't stress, I mean, how many stations have 60, uh, well, how many stations in this room have more than 50% of your members as sustainers? Is that a pretty rare, rare event? Yeah, I mean, so the economic value of that is enormous. Right, you know, your ability to grow if you're keeping the bucket plugged in, you know, which is what a sustainer program does, uh, is significant. 
And it's not just about money. You know, I am a marketer, fundraiser, so I think about monetization all the time. But it's about innovation. Again, House of Cards, um, they saw insights in their data, Netflix, that said, let's launch this new show. You know, they're becoming an original programmer. They, they are a serious threat to the traditional programmers in that sense because they have this vast data set to mine that, you know, the other stations really just, um, the other content sources don't have. And I would posit that you have that potential advantage as well. You know, you've got these enormous data sets that can be mined. So it could be what, you know, what new contents we should we produce? What format should they be? Uh, and then also the channel investment. Someone asked me at dinner, um, you know, just how much should we be investing in digital? And yes, the direction is up, but I can't tell you how much until you see the data. You know, the data has to drive those decisions and those, uh, those, in, those investments that you make. So again, having the data in place and having a way to derive the right insights from it and saying, here are the questions we want to answer, like, you know, who should we target for sustainers and what should we ask them? What's the right campaign ask? Uh, and what's the right ask amount? Those are all important questions that can be derived from the data and through testing. So let's just talk about sources of data. Um, classically, people think of behavioral data as the first source of data, and most people think of behavioral data as just transactional. So what do people actually do, and what do they respond to, and what do they not respond to? So in the world of direct marketing, we look at you know, when someone gave, how much they gave, what campaign they responded to, how frequently they respond, what they do not respond to. That's, that's a source of data that I would posit that most of you guys kind of collect and, and harness today. What's less used is engagement data. So non-transactional data that could be predictive. Someone comes to an event, someone signs up for email, someone calls you up and changes their physical mailing address. Someone um, you know, clicks on content, someone downloads the app, et cetera. Those can be highly, highly predictive, insightful pieces of data, but are any of you using those points of data today to refine any of your marketing strategies in terms of who you target for different campaigns or how you target them? Is anyone, is anyone doing that? A little bit in the major detail. Okay, okay. Um, what we're starting to see, though, is that that engagement data is pretty predictive. Affinity and relationship. So um, one of our kind of poster child clients at Convio was the ASPCA. And about seven or eight years ago, we realized that in the world of animals, there are essentially two types of people. There are dog people and there are cat people. And then there are people who are, you know, rabbit people, horse people, that kind of stuff. But 80% of the world divides into those two camps if, if in the animal welfare world. We found that sending cat pictures to cat people versus dog pictures, pictures to dog people or vice versus generic mixes of the two drove responses rates, responses 50 to 100% higher. <laughs> Pretty simple observation, but very, very powerful. In the healthcare world, um, groups like the MS Society, cancer, et cetera, have found relationship to a disease to be a very big predictor. Are you a sufferer? You know, are you uh, a survivor in the case of cancer? Are you a family member? Are you a friend? Or are you just someone who's passionate? And knowing those different things about you uh, is highly predictive of how you're likely to respond to different campaigns and actually what types of solicitation or messaging will resonate most likely with you. It's common sense when you think about it, but it's, it drives a 10 to 30% lift in response rate when you tweak according to these audience segments. You're sitting on a, on a massive amount of data. I saw that um, stories and streaming were the two you know, most prominent things that people were doing. Um, well, what stories? And can you tie those to the individual? So if I'm, a, again, to play this out, if I love Marketplace and that's what I really obsess about, you know, knowing that about me, can that help you tailor your messaging to me? Can that help you direct your asks in a way that uh, will yield a higher response? And I think you guys are sitting on an enormous opportunity here in terms of understanding affinity. Now, the challenge is that some of that is not happening on your own website, right? Some of it's bouncing to other sites. But guess what? There are, there are tools and technologies now that allow you to track across sites. It requires collaboration, and it requires infrastructure being deployed across sites. But there are, there are now analytics packages that allow you to track users at an individual level. So if Vinay comes back to KUT 
uh, and then he comes back 30 days from now, you can track me on an individual basis, not just at an aggregate statistic basis. Then, you know, if deployed correctly, if I go visit Marketplace, you should be able to track that interaction as well without Marketplace having to collect my email address and make me have an unsatisfactory experience of having to register myself on multiple sites. The tracking technology now exists that individuals can be tracked across sites in a network at an individual level. So is that a powerful concept that could apply to you guys that could actually help you refine what you know about people and therefore refine how you engage them? It's not necessarily a big brother thing like the target is on because it's actually about providing more value to your audience. If you know me and understand me, you can communicate to me in a more relevant way and you can you know, introduce, you know, ask to me that are going to be more relevant to me as well. Who is anybody doing research in kind of off-site activities? Let me give you, uh, here's, if, here's one you can go back and you can do next week and it won't take you more than an hour. Um, but it was really il illuminating for me. Um, we own the classical music stations in South Florida. And one of the things I did is I went to the, you know, the singles ads, the personal ads, and I downloaded them from the Miami Herald and about five other places. And it took me a whopping 15 minutes after I downloaded them to find out that about 2% of the ads said they listened to classical music or they listened to classical South Florida. So then I went back and did it for Minnesota and downloaded the same number of single ads from a couple of different sources. It was much higher. It was like 7 to 8%. That's an affinity group. It took me less than an hour to identify a group of people. And in some cases, it's, it's 1,000 plus people. So that's an easy thing to do. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about they. And in the, the case of Minnesota, it was people who actually said, public radio listener. I love public radio. That was one of the ways they self-identified. Um, but just think about all of the different kinds of things you do. There are tons of people in those ads who say, news junkie or indie music person or whatever. Go find those people. That's a natural set of affinities. And once you bring them together, then you can start this data collection route. Because some of this gets really hard when you start talking about we need to make investments here, we need to make investments there. That is an hour of time and a sp Google spreadsheet. John. Do us a favor, and okay, so now you've got the so-called data on the dating sites for, for what you have. What's the next step? Because maybe I don't understand. So it. the next step in our case, I mean, one of the things, that's, you know, that's what we're trying to figure out, because those are all, and you know, those are anonymous, because you have to pay a lot of money. But you know what? We do spend some money on marketing. So why wouldn't I buy an ad, in your case, in the Boston Globe want ad sections and hold an event for those people and say two or 300 show up? You've got the names. I mean, part of this is what are the different routes that you can take to collecting names? You can go buy names. You can buy access to that. But... That's an exp that can be an incredibly expensive proposition. This is a low-level way to do some event marketing, to create an affinity um, that doesn't require outside of some staff time and a little bit of planning, something you know, a way to start to aggregate people in different ways. So sponsor a singles night at the office. Right, you could. I mean, there's there's those kinds of things. You could just invite them to a to a station tour. If they love public radio, why not take out an ad and just do a station tour? Bob. Um, and this um, so, Vinay, you said a couple of times that we have this uh, powerful network, and I, I would say that we. I would suggest we do and we don't. Um, I mean, in theory we do, uh, but this is, and I'm not a station, so from outside of the station perspective, 
that, that the data and the, 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 the knowledge that we have at this point, which admittedly is, is partial, um, is closely held. Yes. Very closely held. <clears throat> and so you suggest some opportunity, even if we, if we start to explore affinity behavior across just, say, public radio programming or local station or national programmer and, and local, we start to share that, that there's reward at the end of the tunnel. Um, mm -hmm. Couple of questions about where we start. One, do we need, in order to do that, in your experience, a common data model or common infrastructure? <coughs> and and then, um, you know, because that 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 data and knowledge of, of, of a given station's members are so uh, are so closely held and so part and parcel to their economic future, what are the risks that you see, and do you see, in your experience? Um, you know, significant reward for sort of breaking down some of those barriers and agreeing to either a common data model or the business rules to share data. Do you see that as being, you know, okay. you, should we go there, I guess, is my yeah. question. I guess I'm asking for your two cents. Yeah, so the short answer is a common data model and common infrastructure would make it easier, but it's not necessary. Um, you, you need a, a way to aggregate that data. The, the most important thing you need is trust, right? So... It's going to require, and it and it won't be nation, you know, it won't be nationwide day one. I, I think I'd get a small group of stations together that would be a representative data set, probably some of the larger stations, frankly, so you have enough data to mine, um, and have uh, agreement around how that data is going to be used. It's only for analytics right now and only for insight gathering. We're not going to do anything programmatic or uh, marketing oriented at a national level with that data. You know, certainly without the permission of this group of, of stations, it's there to for us to sort of draw inferences that all of us can benefit from. And there has to be that trust established first and foremost. Um, they can keep the systems they have in place. They can keep the data structures they have in place because there are simple ways to kind of extract data and sort of manipulate it to get it in the right format. If you start to learn that there are really important inferences that can only occur at a, a national aggregate level, sure, you should head in the direction of making that data interchange process more streamlined, but that's not where I'd start. You'd want to understand what inferences can you infer. And it doesn't just have to happen at a national level. At a local station level, at a station of this size or bigger, certainly, there's, a, there's enough data locally to start to do predictive modeling. I would argue it's, I mean, there's some economic cost associated with building a predictive model. Um, I would argue that a predictive model that works for a mid-sized station in Austin may be fairly predictive in similar size stations around the country. There'll be nuances, and ultimately you're gonna to wanna to build predictive models per station on their own data set. And it may not be worth it in the very small stations to do that, but certainly mid to large stations, I'd argue there's value at a per station level to do some of this work. But it, there's clearly value at a national level too. But I would, I would take the baby step of saying, you know, let's put a project together. Let's get a group of representative stations, maybe 10, to pull their data. Let's agree on the framework and of how this data is going to be used and, you know, and, and establish that trust and have the right person with the right skill set kind of ask the right questions of the data set and make sure the data is all structured properly. So when you say a predictive model, um, outside of the example you gave about House of Cards or Target, mm -hmm. uh, knowing the sixteen-year-old was pregnant. Yeah. Um, w give us some examples? examples of how, and, and how is a predictive model different than we just sat through a presentation on analytics? Yeah. Which tells us what people are already doing. Yeah. So a predictive model is about targeting individuals. So again, back to the Target example, is in the Target stores, they sent coupon packs to individuals, you know, based upon the data that they knew about them. Um, the University of St. Louis is targeting where their major gift officers spend time based upon a predictive model. They're looking at factors like gift patterns, but also other engagement factors. Does this person come to reunion? Do they volunteer with a school for recruitment efforts? And they're building this model that says, these factors are predictive, based upon past data, and these factors are not predictive, and we are gonna direct where our major gift officers spend their time based upon this model. Um, I've seen other people, uh, I can't remember who, but some of my clients in the past would say, here of our universe of uh, 200,000 people, here are the 
10,000 that we think have the highest propensity to become sustainers. We're going to spend a lot of money on those people trying to convert them versus trying to convert everybody because we think we have a higher conversion likelihood with that as well. So that's when predictive models play. It's about when you want to direct, do a directive strategy at a certain universe of people, that's a subset of the total universe. Great. Third party data. Um, how many of you today have experimented with a pending third party data on your file? Mosaic, you know, psychographic data, what magazines people are reading, demographic data, or things like that. Any, anyone experimented with that? This is one of these things that's probably hard for any one station to do alone. Um, I think certainly, again, for the mid to large stations, there would be a, a clear ROI for doing this. But if we could actually prove in a test case that there's some value here, I bet we could scale it. I bet we could find a way to get it out and more distributed, just like you're doing on the you know, analytic framework side. You know, build something that can be generalizable, that can be spread to others. And I'm going to show you a few examples of how some nonprofits are using third-party data. So what we've seen in the engagement world is that there are events that can be predictive. Clicking on an email, visiting a website, or attending an event um, might be predictors as to whether someone is more likely or not to convert from being a pure audience member to being a member, if they're a lapsed member to actually be able to reactivate them, uh, or potentially to upgrade as well. Now, I think the model needs to figure out how predictive they are versus other factors. But one of the things um, that I've seen is um, in the e-commerce world, if someone goes to a shopping cart and creates a shopping cart, like they're about to buy something and then they abandon, uh, or if, if you've ever done that, have you ever sort of had an email a day or two later that seems highly targeted? Well, guess what? That's not a, not a coincidence. That's a piece of predict a predictive model that's calculated that if someone has tried to do a purchase and they abandon it, the, the propensity of, if you can get them back to the site, the propensity of them converting is extremely high. And that's an example of a predictive modeling work, working in the commercial world. Do you think if you've got two donors, two, two, two members, and they're both one year lapsed, but one has continued to suddenly kind of, you know, starts visiting your website again and getting an email because maybe they found some content of interest in them, and the other one doesn't, do you think they're of equal likelihood to convert, or do you think the person who's engaged with you has a higher propensity to convert? I would think there's probably some predictive value in that. But that's one of those things that the model needs to figure out. I can't answer that for you until you start to see the data. But that's what the kinds of tests that both commercial and nonprofit marketers are doing now to try and understand how to improve their yield. Um, I kind of mentioned this before, but the math can be very meaningful. When you learn about affinity, um, your ability to do more targeted marketing to people and, and drive higher response rates can be very meaningful. Again, just something as simple as understanding, should I show a cat picture to a cat person or a dog picture to a dog person, has had a profound impact in terms of how these groups market. What happened with the ASPCA is they learned this through their digital efforts. It was the digital team who figured this out. And now they're doing that in direct mail as well. They're sending pictures in direct mail uh, of cats to cat people and seeing a higher lift there. So and I know most of you are in the digital realm, this is the place where a lot of the, the new insights can be derived first uh, because it's so low cost to learn these things about people. To construct tests in the mail it takes a lot of time, it's very expensive, but a lot of the insights can be derived in this channel first. Um, and in the, in the world of third party data, um, what people are determining is who should they spend money on targeting, what sort of appeal should be sent, and how much should they ask for? So in the case of one national health charity, they found that they, had, uh, they, they did an overlay on their file of psychographic and demographic data. And that would include, again, things like what magazines these people read, you know, predictors of affluence, et cetera. And they found that historically they'd been treating these two, two segments identically in their direct marketing. And by targeting certain campaigns to the affluent segment versus the core retiree segment, they found a dramatic change and improvement in, in their response rates. Uh, they also found that when they tried to um, target a nostring that asked for more money of the core audience, it turned them off and suppressed response rates. Whereas with the 
uh, affluent audience, it actually improved response rates and improved uh, the average gift amount. So it was really very profound and meaningful for them, for them to actually start to mine this third-party data. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is something that's probably hard for most stations individually to do, maybe not the large stations, but at a system-wide level, if we start to embrace it and test it, I think these are things that could be done um, and, and kind of rolled out. Do you have anything to add to that, Mike? No, other than, I mean, you've mentioned three or four different ones now. Which of these, I mean, I come back to this question. If you have limited resources, where do you put the stake in the ground? Do you buy Mosaic? Do you try to do affinity tracking? I mean, where? if I'm already, if I'm convinced I should do something, where do I start? You start with what you have. So if you've got affinity data in place because you've been tracking it through surveys or through click data, because you are track, you know, you're tracking, well, you're tracking um, clicks on an aggregate level. You know, you may not be tracking them on an individual level. Um, I would start with what data you have first and foremost, but then I would actually try and ascertain should I um, start to find ways to track individual click data more easily as well because it's if we think it could be predictive i need that underlying data set but i'd start by aggregating the data for one or more stations doing a simple data overlay a third-party data overlay which is 10 minutes five minutes um which is is inexpensive um relatively speaking um you don't have to buy 300 data points you could right. buy five to ten and, and see if it actually shows any um, repeatable behavior. I've seen people build predictive models for under $25,000, and that may sound like a lot for one station, but if you think about the fact that the model is probably gonna be 80 to 90% right once you build it once and can reuse it again and again and again, and you can use it each year and across stations, the economics become very, very effective. So how many of you think that there's some, I mean, you there is something in this big data CRM world that is going to be valuable to your station. Who is convinced that there's something there? Okay, that's good. So do, let's take the the contra. Who's con, who, There were lots of hands that didn't go up. So could someone speak to what is it that you, what makes you skeptical that you're like, if I have to decide where I'm going to make investments, this is probably not high on my priority list. It would be great to hear from someone who doesn't. Well, the lack of response could be it's not in their portfolio. So say more about that. Well, it's not in the category of work that they're focused on um, versus in my role, absolutely. We want to find ways to better engage with our audience and turn that directly into revenue. Um, other people have other roles. So is it just, it's not your, you don't think it's your responsibility? How many of you don't think that this is one of the top three or four places that your station company should make investment? Okay, so you're all convinced that this is a place to invest. Yeah. I, I think that the question actually which re relates to sort of the difficulty of big data, which is that to succeed in big data, you need cross-departmental collaboration. Mm -hmm. There isn't just a one division that's going to benefit. It's everybody. How did the, you know, how did the cat people, fig how did you even give pe uh, get people to figure out who like cats? How did you decide to uh, shoot it over to the direct mail group instead of leaving it in digital? How do you talk across each other and make sure that there is a one company goal instead of a marketing right. goal. I saw another hand back there. Well, I, we think it's very important to invest in um, only because we had a listener offer to do it for us pro bono. <laughs> and after signing many, many agreements to allow him access to mm -hmm. our data and his company, now we see the incredible value we get out of this. But every time he gives us something valuable, it's going to cost a fortune to implement it. Right. But it's, a, it's amazing data. So let me take that question one step further. How many of you are willing to risk other things in order to do this? You are willing to put something important at risk 
in order to move down this world of big data CRM analytics? How, show of hands, if you're actually, there's things you're willing to put at risk at your station to do this. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think the issue is that, you know, there's a lot of digital people in this room. I think the digital people at most stations probably really see the value in it and are trying to preach the gospel of CRM, mm -hmm. but the membership people um, in many cases are kind of freaked out about it but for several reasons. One, it would divert resources from just keeping the membership program going, and two, they see, you know, the huge amount of data that has to get transferred from a legacy database to something CRM related, and that just scares them, and so they're very reluctant to initiate a process change because of cost and because of you know the amount of effort. Right. So we've got five minutes, and I want to make sure if you have a question specific for Vinay that you get to ask it. Norm. Well, I was going to make a comment, which is from a station manager perspective, this is really useful stuff because we do track the giving of people who uh, attend events, and particularly if you're doing something that's a friend raiser and you're not sure you really this was really worth it. We know that the people who have attended, particularly major donors, increase their giving by an average of 20%. We also know that the uh, typical planned giving prospect is not your rich person in town, but it's somebody who's been a long time, maybe a 20-year member of the station. If you know that they were a teacher or a librarian, if you know that they were never married, don't have kids, yeah. you have got a prime plan giving suspect. <laughs> and that may sound funny, but we've got, we have one of the best plan giving programs in the country. We have over 250 people in our legacy society. So there's a lot of stuff you can get out. If, uh, you know, and believe me, you know, I'm always trying to dig into the data and you know, this would be great. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hand back there. Um, I guess I, I guess I'm still trying to understand the difference between big data versus just looking at your database and confirming suspicions. You know, yeah. because I, I guess my understanding is that, that the thing that's kind of interesting about the whole concept of big data is it finds these connections that you normally wouldn't think about. You know, it surfaces these things. Oh wow, that's amazing. This and this. Um, or am I wrong? Yeah, I, I, I could be. It, I've been wrong. You know, I think it's a. To be honest, I think the term is dangerous because it's all relative. Big data for PNG is very different than big data for KUT, right? I mean, it's a different scale. Um, I think the point is it's looking beyond the common data sets that you might look at. So if you're, again, my lens is fundraising, so I tend to talk about that a lot. Typically, fundraisers look at transactions only. They don't look at engagement data. They don't look at affinity data. They don't look at third-party data. Okay, for the most part, right? These are, these are the opportunities. So it's saying we need to look beyond the vanilla basic sets, sets of data that we're looking today, and that may not by real standards constitute big data in a commercial sense by any means, but it may be four or five or 10 times the data set that we look at today. And if you incorporate digital data, it could be 100 times the data set we look at today because we're looking at click patterns and things like that at an individual level. And you know, the number of clicks on emails may be vastly higher than the number of transactions, right? So it could be 100 times higher, but it doesn't fit the criteria of big in the commercial sense. But the point is, it's, it's a broader data set than you look at today. It may be an order of magnitude higher than you look at today. It's about aggregating it in one place. So yes, to the person who said that you know, you've got to collaborate cross functions and interdepartmentally, yes. But these silos are breaking down with inside you know, enterprises. Like, most of my large nonprofit clients have actually started to merge, um, and I'm still talking like I'm at Cambio, I left there a year ago, but um, merge uh, offline and online data, right? St. Jude's Children's Hospital, uh, you know, the person who owns, uh, well, that's actually one of the groups that's still siloed, but at, say, the ASPCA, it's a merged group where they, you know, online and offline data is being commingled because they realize, you know, that. These aren't two constituents that are distinct. It used to be five years ago, but these are, you know, the majority of people, you know, an increasing preponderance of people are in both channels. So you've got to start to co-mingle these data sets as you guys are starting to do stuff in the social realm. You've got to pull that in as well. And then it is about building intelligent models that ask the right questions. The first thing you've got to do is say, what are the questions we want to answer? And they could be, you know, um, you know, is my format of programming correct for my audience? You know, am I missing the mark? Um, uh, or it could be revenue oriented. I really want to build a sustainer program like NPR. You know, I'm, I've got 15% sustainers and I want to get to 25%. 
you know, how can I find my next 10% most economically? But start by saying these are my top one, two, three, four, five questions. What data do I think, do I have a hunch might be predictive? Make sure that they, that data is in the system and then, you know, do some modeling. And again, I would say um, there's enormous opportunities to share costs across the network here because I bet if the gentleman here, the general manager who said that librarian single females of certain ages become great, are great plan giving prospects in his city, I bet that probably much applies in other cities as well. I remember having in the public TV world, Houston and uh, LA in a, in, a, in a meeting, KCT in a, in a meeting together, and the person from LA was, my audience, you know, they're just not online. And then I asked Houston, what percentage of your audience have you calculated online? 60%. It's like, are the people in LA so dramatically different than the people in Houston? You know, or are you just not looking at the right data sets and, and analyzing your program correctly? So I, I really think there's some enormous, enormous shared opportunities. And again, having a way to share these insights with each other, maybe collaborate and pull resources and budget to do things across a couple of stations is a way to get going. You know? Well, listen, everyone, join me in thanking Vinay because this is great to have someone with this knowledge. And um, I would just say I think it's really important that as a system, I, I often get a little skeptical when we use the word system a lot, but um, I think that this is one that does require a lot of more conversation and it is one of those places where there's probably some ways that we collectively lift all the boats. So um, I hope that we find ways to keep that going. So thanks.